Um, I suppose with tonight's deliberations on Brexit, it's a sort of talking about the weather is a bit of light relief, really, isn't it, from what's going on? Um, in fact, I thought I would start with um, a quote from uh, something that amused me when I, when I read it, um, from uh, Thomas Hardy's The Mayor of Casterbridge. Um, some of you probably have read the book, but um, the protagonist, Henchard, uh, uh, is, is in a really bad way. He's turned to farming, and it's been a kind of disaster. He, he always buys, buys the wrong crops or harvests at the wrong time, and you know, he's rapidly going bust, and he sees all his colleagues making lots of money. And in desperation, his last, you know, last roll of the dice is to go and see the weather forecaster. Um, and uh, it's clear uh, that uh, this is a very, this is something you don't want to be seen to be doing. So he goes out at the dead of night, you know, with his coat over his head, so nobody sees him. And he goes to some, you know, mysterious place outside the village where the weather forecaster um, uh, hangs out. And um, so there we go. In a lonely hamlet a few miles from the town, there lived a man of curious report as a forecaster of weather. And he asks him basically, what's, you know, what's the harvest going to be like? And the answer is, as you can see here, by the sun, moon, and stars, uh, the clouds, the winds, the trees, the grass, candle flame swallows, smell of the herbs, cat's eyes, ravens, leeches, spiders, dung mixen. Um, not quite sure what dung mixen is, but I guess it's something to do with dung. Um, the last fortnight will be rain and tempest. So there we are. Um, so this was in 1886. Um, and probably around the turn of the century, people started to think about how to formulate weather forecasting as a scientific um, uh, topic. And after the Second World War, with the advent of digital computers, people started to actually code up these equations onto computers and actually make weather forecasts. And then in the 1970s, the, all the satellites started to be launched, and we had lots of instruments measuring uh, the atmosphere to provide, you know, the starting conditions for the, for the weather forecast. So you'd think that everything would be just hunky-dory uh, compared to uh, uh, 1886, but of course, if we fast forward 100 years, um, <laughs> it seems like we haven't uh, improved at all. So this is the, uh, I guess a lot of you in the audience will, I mean, normally when I speak to students, I have to say, well, this was the guy, you know, <laughs> back in dawn of prehistory. Uh, but anyway, so Michael Burke uh, famously said, well, you chaps were a fat lot of good last night. If you can't forecast the worst storm for several centuries, uh, just a few hours before, what, what on earth are you doing? Okay. So, um, and in fact, people have, um, other people have kind of uh, leapt onto the, to the bandwagon. And here's uh, an article uh, from a few years ago now, but in the Telegraph, uh, it's actually um, reviewing a book from a climate skeptic. Uh, by, the, by the correspondent Charles Moore, and basically he's saying, well, you know, look, weather, for weather forecasts go wrong, they can go wrong like Michael Fish just a few days ahead, they can certainly go wrong a month ahead, so what hope is there for saying anything at all about, you know, climate change 100 years from now? So the game is up for climate change believers, uh, it's all, you know, it's all a gigantic uh, hoax, it's a weather forecast for a century ahead, and it can therefore have no value as a prediction. All right, so the purpose of my talk is to uh, try to at least uh, answer, or attempt at least to answer, these sorts of questions. Why do weather forecasts go wrong? Uh, what can we do about it if they do go wrong from time to time, which they obviously do? And what are the implications for our understanding of climate change? Is it something that means that, uh, you know, we are, it's a hopeless task or what? Okay. So that, that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's going to be the theme of the talk. So I just thought I would start, since I mentioned satellites, in showing you a, a, a movie of the Earth from space. Let's see, hope this works. Just, it's just a nice animation of um, clouds from composites of satellite images. Basically just kind of showing you it's a real, rather complicated system. It's sort of like a turbulent fluid. Uh, lots of scales of motion uh, going on. Um, you, you saw the weather system, the mid-latitude weather systems going across from, uh, from west to east. And those, those blobs, well in fact, we'll, if I go on to the next slide... Uh, whoops. Okay. 
The next slide is an animation over the tropical West Pacific where these sort of things bubbling up are thunderstorms. They're really uh, transporting a lot of moisture into the atmosphere from the warm sea surface. And then occasionally these clouds start forming tropical cyclones and you can see the eye of these two. Okay. So again, no matter what scale you look at, I could have sh then shown you a blow up of you know, one of these cloud systems and you'd see all sorts of turbulent scales within that. So we're looking at a very complex you know, multi-scale system. And as I say, um, I do want to talk a little bit about science. I hope to not to, um, it won't get too technical. I will show you a couple of equations, but in fact there's already three there. But you can view equations two ways. You can completely ignore them. Uh, what I really want you to do with equations is just, just marvel at, uh, and I'll, I'll say, <laughs> just mar marvel at them. Um, so, um, there are three branches of physics which goes into weather forecasting. One is stuff, if you've done any like O-level physics, you may remember from school, Newton's laws of motion. There's Isaac Newton. And the second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration. You hit something with a force, and it accelerates uh, depending on the mass of the object. So uh, that's one. The second guy is uh, Max Planck, and he was the... German founder of quantum physics, which is very much a 20th century physics. Of course, Isaac Newton back in the 17th century, so it's classical physics. Um, Max Planck, very much 20th century physics. And that's important for understanding how photons from the sun actually get absorbed by, you know, by the oxygen, by the water molecules, uh, and indeed how they hit the, you know, when they hit the surface, how they're absorbed. And indeed, then, how those uh, photons are re-emitted back to space as much lower wavelength kind of heat energy, infrared energy. So that all has to be coded up into a, into a model as well. And the third one uh, is a guy that probably, I, my guess is nobody will know, but if you think you know, anyone know? Big prize if you get it right. It's a guy called Rudolf Clausius. And he actually was the person that uh, invented the term entropy. If you ever heard the word entropy, uh, he, he, he did it. But basically what we're looking at here is uh, the second law of thermodynamics. So this is 19th century physics, uh, you know, the original physics to try to understand how steam engines and such like work. Turns out the atmosphere is, is very much a thermodynamic engine. And in fact, the reason we have those storms that uh, track across the Atlantic and I guess from what I was hearing often hit Glasgow on a Wednesday afternoon... Um, <laughs> is actually, that is the most efficient way, those swirly things, is the most efficient way of transporting heat from the tropical latitudes to the poles. So you're actually looking at an extremely efficient heat engine. The reason why that is, is to do with the rotation of the Earth, and it's too, not enough time to, to, to say exactly why that is. But it is a fact of the matter, those, those uh, weather systems are really transporting heat from, um, you know, a, a, a year or so ago, I was on, a couple of years ago, I was on the uh, Today program, and they were worried that um, some storm had increased the temperature of the North Pole uh, momentarily for a day or two. And the, the interviewer asked me, you know, is this, is this disaster? Is this what the, is the North Pole going to melt? And I said, no, this is what these storms are supposed to do. This is their function in life, is to transport heat to, to those high latitudes, and then it, it escapes out to space. So this is perfectly normal. This wasn't the answer she wanted, actually, but um, <laughs> there we go. Maybe, maybe I helped educate a bit. Right. Now, you may have heard about quantum physics, very, you know, Schrodinger's cat and, and uh, you know, uncertainty principles and all that. So you might think that quantum mechanics is the most difficult part or the most uncertain part uh, of a model. But actually, it's not. It, the most difficult and uncertain part uh, is to do with that first equation, Newton's uh, second law of motion. So here is that equation again. So I'm sorry, this is getting, you know, lots of equations. But you this is really, really is one you have to marvel at. Because this is, this is uh, a form of that Newton's law that is applicable to, you know, the atmosphere and the oceans and, and any fluid dynamical system. It's the thing which actually generates turbulence. And with about 23 mathematical symbols, you can describe, this equation describes everything 
in the, in the world from the scale, the largest possible scales um, associated with jet streams, you know, which go across the Atlantic, they've got scales of tens of thousands of kilometres, all the way down to, you know, the air coming out of my mouth and the turbulence in this room. It's all described, these, you know, multiple scales of motion by that one equation. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, it's a work of art, and there's a work of art of Renoir. <laughs> But actually, um, I'm not going to use the Renoir as my analogy. I'm going to use a Russian doll. So Russian doll also a work of art. And this is a very special Russian doll. A Russian dolls unpack into smaller Russian dolls. This Russian doll unpacks into yet smaller Russian dolls and yet smaller Russian dolls and yet smaller Russian dolls and so on and so forth. And the analogy is that if I want to actually solve that equation on a computer, beautiful as it is mathematically, I actually have to unpack it. And it unpacks into literally billions of individual equations. And this is why solving this equation is so unbelievably difficult. And it's by far and away the most difficult part of a weather forecast model. The quantum mechanics and the thermodynamics is relatively easy by comparison. Um, so, technically, all those Russian dolls, they describe, the biggest Russian doll, as I say, could describe, you know, the jet stream, which is fairly, you know, it's, it's kind of trundles across, jet stream is a very large scale, um, sort of undulating river of air, if you like, up in the high atmosphere. And it's all it's coupled together to scales, as I say, it could be almost sub-millimeter scales. So, it's a fantastic range of scales described by that one equation. But, but that's because that mathematics hides the fact that it's really billions of equations which have to be unpacked and solved individually on a computer if you really want a weather forecast. All right, but the problem is that even with today's computers, big as they are, you can't uh, represent such a range of scales. We can't go down to millimeter scales. So basically, in weather prediction, climate prediction, you have to start chopping these... Uh, Russian dolls, throwing them away because it's just there are too many of them to solve. So here we are, I'm throwing the whole lot away. Uh, and <coughs> typically, you s well, if I'm running a climate model where I'm trying to predict what's happening, you know, 100 years from now, um, typically you can, you'll have to stop at about 100, the, the Russian doll that's about 100 kilometers in scale. Because if you put any more in, the computer just doesn't, you know, doesn't, is too, isn't big enough. It'll take you, you know, if it takes you six months to do your climate forecast, it's not terribly useful. So, and it's certainly not useful if you're trying to do a 10-day weather forecast if it takes six months. So, um, so, now that, but that, so, now that, so that picture on the left is, a, uh, is one of those uh, big low pressure systems that trundles across. Uh, this, is, this is part of North America. That's pretty well captured, actually, by... So there's the Russian, so that's got a scale of maybe a thousand or so kilometers. So that's covered by one of these Russian dolls, that's fine. But that uh, thunderstorm cloud, um, and I saw some nice ones, nice anvil clouds coming up uh, today on the train, um, would, um, that would be too small. That was, those things only have scales of tens of kilometers. So we can't, but on the other hand, as I will try to explain a bit later, clouds are crucially important for um, uh, understanding the climate system. So we have to represent them in some way, and they're represented by simplified formulae. So I've represented a simplified formula by a rather inelegant uh, block of wood, so compared with the uh, elegant Russian doll. All right, so we're now in a position to have a look at what the world looks like from inside a computer. Okay, so this is not a satellite animation anymore, it's a computer solving those, uh, those equations, the Newton's laws of motion. Um, and you can see on this global scale, um, it's, it's capturing, it's certainly capturing the sort of irregularity of, of, um, uh, of the atmosphere, it's capturing those uh, weather systems as in the, both the northern and southern hemisphere, that's all pretty good, but if we, um, if, we uh, ex if we blow up now to look again at that area in the tropical West Pacific where all those uh, thunderstorms were occurring, get this right, 
You can see it looks a bit more like, it's sort of blobby, isn't it? It's sort of granular. It's like a pointilliste type of painting rather than, you can tell, you know, you can instantly tell you're not looking at the real world here. Nevertheless, it does spin off, it can spin off tropical cyclones like that. But it's kind of not, you know, it's not quite uh, right. And that is purely due to, you know, the fact that the computers are not big enough. Okay, good. Right, so let's, with that as background, let's come back to uh, Michael Fish and, and, and indeed uh, uh, Henchard of, uh, of um, the mayor of Casterbridge. Um, and there is a, a, an Achilles heel, I guess would be the word to say, phrase to say, in this notion of trying to predict weather in a deterministic sense, in the sense of saying it will be, you know, sunny, rainy, windy, the harvest weather will be good, bad, if you say anything very definite, there, there, is, a, there is a very sort of uh, intrinsic scientific problem. And we call it these days the butterfly effect, and I, I think the phrase has now become pretty common currency. It was actually uh, made, the phrase of the butterfly effect came from a book, popular science book, by a guy called James Glick, um, who was uh, referring to some work, which I'm going to talk about now, by... Um, a colleague of mine from MIT called Ed Lorentz, who's one of the pioneers of this so-called science of chaos theory. So let me uh, introduce you to Ed Lorentz, and again, some equations which you can just ignore or just marvel at if you like. Um, Ed was... Um, um, Ed worked at MIT, this is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, and... Um, he, was, uh, he, he got interested in the problem of, of long-range forecasting, forecasting, let's say, a month ahead, sort of thing Henchard wanted to do. And um, he had colleagues in the statistics department, by the way, some of whom, one person in particular, was an extremely eminent statistician. And uh, this was in the days, sort of in the 1950s, let's say, when computer models were just starting to be the sort of equa you know, mathematical equations I was talking about are starting to be thought about and th ideas about how to solve them. But these statisticians said, look, you're wasting your time with all this stuff. All you need to do is get a big pile of uh, weather maps from the past. And if you want to know what's going to happen next month, just look at this, just go through your big pile of weather maps and find a, a, a month where the weather patterns, say, around the Northern Hemisphere, look similar to what they do this month. So, um, so they would say, for example, if it was today, they would say, OK, let's suppose, um, what are we in now, November. So we want to know what's, what the weather's going to be like in December. The statisticians would say, OK, maybe November 1948 was very similar to November 2018. Uh, in that case, all you have to do to predict December 2018 is just see what happened in December 1948. So it's a method of analogues. So, you know, they were, they were on at Lorentz day in, day out. He was very keen on the more the doing the mathematics, solving the equations. They said, no, 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 you're wasting your time. Just, just uh, you, you know, use a bit of statistics and based on past data, that's fine. And um, this bothered him because the implications of the statisticians ideas were, would be that the atmosphere was very kind of cyclical. You know, it, it, it went, what it's doing today is a bit like what it did in 1948. So kind of the idea is it goes through cycles. And he had a kind of a hunch, a remarkable hunch, that th that wasn't the way the atmosphere worked. It wasn't cyclical like that, or periodic to be the slightly more precise word. Um, so, but he thought about how can I, how can I prove this? And, you know, because of all the Russian dolls, he couldn't solve the exact equations. So he looked for very simplified approximations to these underlying equations. And he came up with this set, which is basically the equivalent of three Russians. So he's paired one billion down to three Russian dolls. And these three, so the, each Russian doll is now an equation. In, in science, in the, in the science of what's called nonlinear dynamics, these are three of the most celebrated equations that's ever, ever happened. So um, you may not quite appreciate it, but, but these have sparked, it's unbelievable what revolutions they have 
happened in not only in physics, but in biology, economics, engineering, chemistry, every, every branch of science you can think of. Um, these equations have triggered a revolution of, uh, of, of understanding. And the basic property that these equations have, or one of the key properties, is illustrated here. And what I'm showing you are two solutions of those equations which have almost identical initial conditions, starting conditions. Um, and you see for a while they track, e they track the two solutions track each other, but then eventually they completely uh, decorrelate. Now, people had thought that that sort of behavior could be simulated if you had a sufficiently complicated uh, system, but nobody had imagined just with those three equations one could generate such behavior. So this is the phenomenon of chaos, the idea that tiny, 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 infinitesimally, almost infinitesimally small initial uncertainties can completely uh, amplify and sort of destroy any confidence you'd have in what the system is going to do. So that was Lorenz's work. And um, he went on to, I, I'm just going to show this because I need to refer to this later. He, he, but without again getting technical about it, one of the remarkable things he did was he realized, I'm just going to let this animation go, that within a sort of abstract uh, space, the space of the three Russian dolls, the three equations, if you like, the system traces out a remarkable kind of geometry, which we now understand to be a fractal geometry. And a fractal means whatever structure it has on a large scale, and you zoom in, it has that same structure on a smaller scale. And this shows the, the system kind of evolving around on, on this geometric structure. It turns out that this fractal structure is, you know, relates a lot to uh, a lot of modern ideas in, in 20th and 21st century mathematics. And in some sense, what Lorentz did was bring, he joined together the work of Newton, because Newton had discovered the calculus. Newton would have understood what those three Russian doll equations were very well, but he would never have guessed that they had this underlying uh, intrinsic uh, fractal structure. So that was actually one of the, also one of the most important things that Lorentz did, um, which again has had enormous ramifications in, in mathematics and its applications. But I want to go back now to, um, to Michael Fish, because I just want to show you, so that was with a, with a rather idealized system, but let's see what this means in practice. So what I'm going to show you now are two, uh, or the evolution of weather, the weather, um, from a, a, a kind of modern-day mo uh, computer model, run from two, so you're going to see an animation of two weather forecasts run from two different um, initial conditions, um, which are very slightly different from each other. So you, if you look very carefully, you'll see differences. Now these are pressure, you know, isobars, constant pressure at the surface. Um, and it's a couple of days before the, the famous Michael Fish hurricane. Um, so that low pr that's a big low-pressure system to the west of Ireland, which is not, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's not an exceptional weather. That's, that's a fairly, I mean, it's a kind of windy day, but nothing exceptional. So we're looking a couple of days beforehand, and we're going to run our weather um, forecast model from each of these initial conditions, if I can get it to animate. Okay, so here we go. So the model has taken those initial conditions and moved them forward, and now we're, and now we're the day of the of the Michael Fish storm. So the top one, um, if you look sort of the tip of, uh, the bottom tip of Cornwall, that's a little ridge of high pressure. So anyone making a forecast for that day would say, oh, it's going to be a pretty nice day. Um, certainly no strong, I mean, there's almost no gradient in pressure, which means the winds are, are very light. But the bottom one has this, uh, you know, these, these several um, uh, uh, concentric isobars and just to the south of the center, these are very, very tightly packed, which means very, very strong winds indeed. So poor Michael Fish, you know, in those days, he just had the one weather forecast from the Met Office, and it more or less looked like the top one. So he, he said everything's going to be fine. Uh, and of course, if he'd had the bottom one, you know, which, which but for a flap of a butterfly's wings, so to speak, he might have had, um, he would have been a national hero and so on. Now, actually, the truth of the matter is you shouldn't feel sorry for Michael Fish 
because um, I met him uh, a year ago at, at, at the Cheltenham Science Festival, and I realised he's made an extremely good living <laughs> from after-dinner speeches on this storm. So don't, don't feel bad about him at all. He's, he's, he's done absolutely fine. Uh, okay, so... All right, so what, what could we do in that situation? Well, let's imagine, instead of running our model twice, we ran it 50 times from 50 very, very slightly different initial conditions, each one consistent with whatever the observational network was at the time. So these are pressure maps of two, basically two-day weather forecasts uh, from that uh, done, if you like, retrospectively uh, in 1987 using a modern weather forecasting system. And you can see, maybe, the British Isles, uh, you can see the British Isles right there in each one of them. You can see there's a phenomenal sort of range of, of, uh, of um, weather maps. Is this a... Yeah, doesn't work. Okay. Um, well, the, let me take the very first one, the top left. I mean, there's not much going on there. The second one... Oh, we have got one. Right, great. All right. So that... Well, take, I mean, that one, that's our ridge of high pressure. That's a really nice day. Certainly, I don't know where... Certainly in the south of England, it's a nice day. Um, <laughs> maybe not so nice. Anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, whereas these ones, of course, all these ones with these enormous great low-pressure systems are horrendously awful days. So, so this is actually a remarkable uh, range of situations. Uh, so how... The question is, how would you synthesize all this into something, because you can't give, you know, if the weather forecaster <laughs> had to give 50 weather forecasts, you, you'd need a half an hour slot instead of like a minute before the news. Well, one way to do it is to, um, is to try to calculate probabilities. You can think of this as a distribution of 50 possible, you know, potential realizations. You could say, well, how ma in how many of those were the winds of hurricane force? And um, if the answer was, um, uh, well, as you see here, I mean, it's 30%. So fif 15 or something, yeah, 15 out, of 15 out of 50. If 15 out of 50 had hurricane force winds, then you would say there was a 30% probability. So this is, these are actual now maps, not of, um, this is of contours rather, of, um, of uh, or colours if you like, showing not wind force, but the probability that the winds will exceed hurricane force on the 16th of uh, October 1987. So that's what he could have, had, had we had that technology then, this is what he could have uh, said, that there was a, a significant risk of, of a hurricane. I mean, again, we don't, can't say for certain. Um, so what would you do with this information? Um, I mean, let's say some of you... Uh, maybe if you were living down in Kent at the time and you just cashed in your, your pension saving to buy a new Lamborghini, uh, which I hear is what people do these days, then uh, perhaps it wouldn't be a good idea to leave it parked outside under a big oak tree, for example. 60% probability. Um, or if, you, uh, if your wife had just bought you a yacht and you were planning to sail across the channel, 30% uh, probability of a hurricane may be a good idea to not do it right. Wait a few days, see what happens. Um, the important point here is that the, d the decision... Well, let's make... Let's wait, so that was a bit facetious. Let's suppose this was a hurricane. Uh, well, it is a hurricane, actually, but it, it, uh, in the sense of a hurricane about to hit the Caribbean or Florida or something, how high a probability... And you're the town mayor. How high a probability uh, does it have to be to, before you evacuate people? Now, obviously, that's not a decision a meteorologist can make, but a meteorologist can give the town mayor the information the, to make that decision objectively. So having a probability, I mean, if the probability was 1%, you probably wouldn't evacuate because it means 99 times out of 100, the event wouldn't hit. But if the probability was 99%, then you probably would ev evacuate because 99 times out of 100, it would occur. But the question is, where's the dividing line between recommending evacuation and not re recommending evacuation? I don't know. As a meteorologist, I don't know where that dividing line is. It's something which you have to discuss with the person who has to make the decision, and they have to know about, you know, what the upheaval is for evacuating. But at least this type of method um, provides a, an objective 
the objective information to make that kind of decision. In other words, it's an objective method of, of, of formulating the uncertainty in the prediction. I just want to go back to this more abstract uh, Lorentz model just for a minute because it makes the point that, you know, you might get the idea that therefore, okay, forecasting, weather forecasting is hopeless because you're always having these butterflies which, which amplify and ruin forecasts. It turns out that actually uh, the situation where they, where they grow so rapidly that within two or three days they destroy the accuracy of a forecast is extremely rare. And actually, that, that point is, is demonstrated even with that simple uh, Lorentz model with its three, the, the, the three Russian dolls. What we're looking at here is a kind of little ball of uncertainty uh, in the starting condition. And for some starting conditions, like this one, there's actually no growth at all in that uncertainty. So it remains remarkably predictable. Uh, you move down a little bit, and then you start to see some indication of uncertainty. And it's this one where the uncertainty just explodes. So, and it, it, for any sort of cognoscenti in the audience, this is a consequence of what's called the non-linearity of the equations uh, of motion. Now, the point is, um, uh, when you have this ensemble idea, when you run these 50 forecasts, which is basically what we do today in a weather forecasting organisation like the Met Office or European forecast centre where I used to work for a number of years. So we run these forecasts every day. Um, and if you look, say, a week ahead, in many situations it's actually like this. And you can say with some confidence uh, what's going to happen a week ahead. Uh, some of the time it's like this, where there is some significant uncertainty. And other times, you know, you can say virtually n nothing, if you like, or very little, because the uncertainty has exploded. Um, now, they don't tend to show these uh, ensembles very much on the TV, but you often hear the forecasters talk about uncertainty, which is, I think, a great step forward since Michael Fisher's day. They say when things are uncertain. And when, when they say they're uncertain, it's basically because these 50 forecasts are not giving a consistent picture. You know, the front has moved on in some of them or it stayed behind in other ones. So they're, they're not, the forecasters just don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, if you were a fee-paying customer to the Met Office, you would get more tailored probabilistic information. If, you know, and indeed, for a lot of users these days, that actually turns out to be quite important information. Um, so, I, so ensemble forecasting has now even got its own... I mean, this is basically something I, I worked on for, have worked on for many, many years now. Um, uh, and I was pleased to see nothing to do with me. It's got its own uh, Wikipedia page. Um, and, of course, it's not just storms hitting the UK. This is, uh, this is an ensemble of 50 forecasts of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, this was actually this was an important uh, uh, forecast because you can see some of the ensemble members had the tracks going out over the ocean, which is the normal way a hurricane does move it go, if it goes up from the Caribbean due north, it tends to get steered out to sea. But in this particular case, this is like a, over a week ahead from the, from the actual landfall, um, you can see a significant number of the ensemble members had it tracking back over the east coast. Again, a lot of uncertainty where actually it would hit at this range when it was in the Caribbean. But it gives the people on the east coast the first warning that this is something they may need to start uh, preparing for. Um, by contrast, this is uh, um, Typhoon Haiyan, which caused utter devastation. It actually broke some records for the strongest uh, 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 wind strength for a typhoon uh, after it had hit land and caused uh, utter uh, devastation for some areas of the Philippines. Um, and indeed, it's, it was a frustration to me having seen how sort of predictable how, how I mean, th this, was, this was known about, again, this is a forecast from a week or so ahead that it was hitting this area. It's a frustration to me when I see emergency services only start reacting to these events once the hurricane has hit. And certainly something I'm trying to uh, get disaster preparedness agencies to really change is the way they work. And where things are pretty certain like this, um, to start becoming proactive, getting you know, um, emergency 
food and medicine and shelter and so on, water in place before the damping hits. And then um, those of you who may have heard of this thing called the El Nino, it is a, an ocean, oceanic phenomenon uh, in the Pacific Ocean. And it allows us to make forecasts of the general patterns of weather, particularly in the tropical latitudes, on seasonal timescales, so three to three, six months ahead. And this is a so-called El Nino index. Actually, this is right up to date. There's nothing actually very interesting, but it just shows that the El Nino sea surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific are going to remain probably above average, but there's some uncertainty about whether... If they get up to two degrees, that's quite a significant change from the cl normal climatological sea temperatures. Um, but it just shows, again, a kind of um, a plume, if you like, of possible outcomes. All right, so with that under our belt, I want to move to the climate change issue um, and address this, uh, the Charles Moore uh, question about, you know, does, does uncertainty in weather prediction invalidate our use or, or our ability to predict climate change? So climate change, as you're probably aware, I, I, I guess, uh, is um, the question about what is the consequence of this curve. And this curve is a measurement of the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere. It's done at an observatory in the Hawaiian Islands. But carbon dioxide is a, unlike, say, water vapor or something, carbon dioxide is a very well-mixed gas. So if you measure it here in Glasgow, it'll be almost the same anywhere else in the world. So measuring it in Hawaii, one can infer pretty much um, where where it is, uh, it's going to have the same value pretty much everywhere. And what this shows is this, well, first of all, there's this wiggle up and down, which is the annual cycle. So it's the fact that in summer, plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to grow, so atmospheric con concentrations dip a little bit, and then in winter, uh, it, it, it goes out again. So there's this uh, winter, to summer, winter to summer cycle. But on top of that, there's this gradual upward trend. And this is due to our, mankind's, emission of carbon dioxide due to burning of fossil fuels. So fuels of carbon that was laid down millions of years ago, um, typically below ground. Um, and if you go back to pre-industrial times, so to back into the 19th century, the value is at about 285 parts per million. And we're going up to, well, we're now significantly over 400. This is actually not completely up to date, this is only 2016. So it's, got, it's up, it's well above 400 parts per million. Um, and the question is, um, what is the consequence of that? Now, let me first of all show you a couple of analogies um, to, uh, to, uh, to climate change. Um, I'm going to first of all go back to this uh, model that Ed Lorentz came up with to demonstrate the chaos theory, if you like. Um, and um, hmm, I think I forgot to put a slide in. So if you run, um, okay, I just realized I, I, I should have ha first had a slide which showed what would happen if you ran the model. Uh, actually, what I'm doing is I'm putting an extra term in here. This F stands for uh, sort of a climate change term. Uh, without that term, I, what I should have shown you is that this model, uh, the time series, I, I guess I showed you a little bit. When you ran the model just for a little while, it sort of jiggles up, uh, up here or goes down here. If, if you run it for a long period of time, then the time it spends up here is the same as the time it spends down here. But when I've added this term here, it kind of biases the system, so it's spending more time up here than down here. Now, I'm going to show you... Because I forgot to show you the, the, an important slide, I'm going to now move very quickly to uh, a, another analogy, which is, makes exactly the same point as the Lorentz one. And this is, my, this is a much more mechanical analogy. This is the um, executive decision maker, as it's often called. So you, it's, a, it's a pendulum, which um, <clears throat> I'll show you the animation. It's it, a um, kind of magnetic pendulum, and it oscillates irregularly around these four magnets. And uh, the idea is if it's, you have to guess which magnet it will eventually stop on and, 
you know, you buy a million shares if it stops there and you sell a million shares if it stops there or something like that. But what I want you to think about as it's oscillating is that, it's, uh, it's got, that this now represents the state of the atmosphere, if you like, and it's going between, um, it could be warm or, let's say, warm or cold states or, you know, wet or dry states. So these, these four magnets, think of them as definite uh, types of weather states, okay? And what we're going to do is, um, hopefully, yeah, is animate the... <coughs> okay, it goes. Uh, so it, uh, it's actually an example like the Lorentz model of a, of a chaotic system in the sense that trying to predict the motion of that pendulum bob uh, depends very, very critically on knowing the initial condition. So a very slightly different initial state will lead to a completely different uh, trajectory of the pendulum. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a mechanical analogue of, of a chaotic system. Happens to have stopped over the, uh, the yellow magnet. All right, so, so that illustrates, in a way, why it's quite difficult to predict, you know, the, the, the sequence of weather states for, let's say, a few weeks ahead, whether it's going to be warm, dry, wet, cold. Because if I started the pendulum bob very slightly differently, it would track in a different way. However, if I looked at this long enough, I would realize that on average, the pendulum isn't favoring any of those four magnets. It spends, on average, a quarter of the time over each of the four magnets. They're each the probability, you could say, at any instant in time, the probability of being in the blue, on, over the blue magnet is 25%, over the yellow one, 25%, white one, 25%. Red one, 25%. So they're all equally likely. But what I'm going to do now is... Um, yeah, I'm going to sort of bias the system by sliding a little wedge <laughs> underneath. And now off it goes. Now, again, as before, it's completely uh, chaotic in the sense that the trajectory would be very difficult to predict because it depends very, very precisely on the initial condition. But you can see how it's favouring, or well, even though it makes an excursion to that white one, it's clearly favouring uh, the, um, the yellow magnet. And in fact, does it stop there? Yeah. Um, so what I've done is to bias the statistics by sliding the wedge. And in this analogy, the wedge is our emissions of carbon dioxide. So we're biasing the statistics of weather in some way that we have to determine um, uh, by, by the emissions of carbon dioxide. And the fact that the system is chaotic, the fact you can't predict the detailed, like here, you can't predict the motion of the pendulum, doesn't stop you from estimating the changes in the probability of each of those magnet, the, the occurrence of the pendulum bulb over each of the magnets. Now, um, so if, if, uh, if climate, so what, what I'm trying to say here is that climate change, um, in a way it's not, in some sense it's not any different to predicting the difference between, you know, winter and summer. Win the difference in winter and summer is due to the, you know, the, um, the orbit, the tilt of the earth as it cir circles around the sun. So that the sun provides a well-known a, a sort of completely predictable forcing to the atmosphere. Um, and in some sense, you can say that the changes in the statistics of weather between uh, winter and summer are pretty, uh, you know, are pretty, uh, uh, are pretty robust, uh, even though we can't necessarily say what a, any one particular uh, summer will be like if we start from a... Um, from a wintertime initial condition. And indeed, you know, when, as you transition from winter to summer in a particular year, you might actually go into, in February or something, into a cold snap where you think, you know, the sun's come up, the sun's had two months of coming up higher in the sky, and then suddenly we've gone into this cold snap. Well, 
Okay, that's one particular year. But if you took 100 years and put them all together, put all the temperatures together, say for Glasgow or London or anywhere, you'd see a very nice smooth curve of the transition between winter and summer. And it's really that, you know, it's what that sort of expected change uh, in, in the statistics of the weather, um, th this is the nature of the, of the climate change problem. And it's not something, therefore, that is sensitive to initial conditions. So Charles Moore, unfortunately, got it wrong. He, he misunderstood if you like, the nature of the problem. But that actually doesn't make predicting climate change an easy problem. Um, and the, the, you could say, basically, the problem is how thi thick is the wedge. And I want, to, I want to say what I mean by that in a bit more detail. Um, because there are things which can amplify, or indeed damp, uh, the effect of increasing carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, I think you all know, is this greenhouse gas. It traps, um, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's transparent to the uh, visible and indeed ultraviolet light that comes in from the sun, but it's opaque, relatively opaque, to the infrared um, energy that the Earth radiates back to space because it's the Earth's temperature is much lower than the temperature of the Sun, so it radiates photons at a much, uh, with a lower temperature, longer wavelength. That's, uh, that's, uh, qu that's the quantum mechanics. Um, but it's not, it's not as simple as that, because there are certain processes which uh, can uh, and do indeed feed back. So one example is water vapour. So water... Vapor, just to be 100% clear about this, water vapor is the gaseous form of water. So when you look at the uh, atmosphere on a nice clear day with no clouds, there's still water vapor in the atmosphere. But water vapor is also transparent to, to incoming sunlight. It's not blocked by incoming sunlight. But it also is very opaque to the outgoing infrared energy. Um, in fact, the Irish physicist John Tyndall back in the 19th century realised that without this greenhouse effect from water vapour, uh, human life and indeed biological life would not exist on the Earth. The warming from water vapour is, is crucially important in keeping the Earth at an equable temperature. Now, as you, um, as, as I guess everyone knows, as you, if you warm the atmosphere, you can evaporate more water into it from, say, the oceans. Or conversely, if you cool the air, its ability to hold water vapour that has been evaporated from the oceans becomes less. So that's why, you know, in the autumn you get very foggy days, because it cools enough overnight that the water vapour condenses into small droplets of water, which are the fog. So if you now increase carbon dioxide, which has a warming effect, that can be amplified by the additional effect of the increase in water vapour. That, that, so you get additional uh, uh, evaporation of water, and so you've increased water vapour. And now water vapour is the greenhouse gas, so that will, that will add, if you like, to the already warming effect of carbon dioxide. So that's a pretty well understood um, what's called positive feedback process. So it's something that will amplify, and it's probably one of the most important amplifi amplifiers. Um, there are other things I, I've shown, uh, for example, uh, this little piece of melting ice in the Arctic. And that's, again, another well-known positive feedback, that as the, if you have a, a region of the Earth covered in, uh, in ice, which is basically um, white and reflects sunlight back to space, and then that ice melts, it leaves, it leaves a much darker water the surface of the water is much darker and that water can absorb some light. So the melting of ice will also amplify the warming effect. Um, you've probably heard about methane. Methane is, a, is another greenhouse gas that could be released from things like tundra and uh, permafrost if it melts. Um, but the, well, um, carb, car, well, the carbon cycle, carbon is absorbed 
uh, carbon dioxide is absorbed by, particularly by the oceans, and if you start to warm the oceans, their ability to absorb carbon dioxide decreases. It's a bit like a bottle of Coca-Cola. If you warm it up, it suddenly it can't hold all that fizz and it spills over. Um, but the 64, I would say, trillion dollar, literally trillion dollar question, which we don't understand well, is the role of clouds themselves. And that's because clouds have a kind of two different roles, depending on how high in the atmosphere they occur. You're probably, if you're familiar with what are called cirrus clouds, so these are the very, very sort of high level, wispy, basically ice type clouds um, that um, uh, you typically have if you have very anticyclonic weather. These ice, these cirrus clouds actually trap heat. They, they act as a, again, as a, as a kind of blanket on, uh, the, uh, on, the, on trapping heat. Very often, if you have a, a, a night where you have cold temperatures and it looks like there'll be a big frost in the morning, and then actually a, a, a layer of cirrus cloud comes overhead, that will actually stop uh, the, um, the frost from forming. So it has a, has a kind of blanketing effect. So if climate change is to, will increase cirrus clouds, that's bad news because that will be a positive feedback. That will further amplify this blanketing effect. On the other hand, low-level cloud, um, what's called stratus cloud, which is very common, of course, uh, in winter, um, blocks the sun completely. Um, that cirrus cloud, uh, sorry, stratus cloud reflects sunlight back to space from the top of the cloud deck. So increasing globally the amount of low-level stratus-type cloud um, will actually be, have a damping effect on climate change. I have to say, unfortunately, most of the models are going in the wrong direction. So they have cirrus, so you have cirrus cloud increasing and stratus cloud decreasing, which is really the, absolutely the wrong direction um, for what we would like. But having said that, because all of these cloud processes are represented not by the beautiful Russian dolls, but rather inelegant, um, approximate formulae, there is considerable uncertainty about this. And I would say that is the single most important element of uncertainty. And I spend a lot of my time trying to um, persuade the government, uh, you know, to, uh, well, EU governments, I don't know how long that will last, but anyway, to... Um, to, to, uh, to invest in, uh, in yet bigger supercomputers because if we can really get these Russian dolls down to the scale of clouds, then that will really uh, help understand this majorly uh, uncertain process in the, in the climate system. Okay, so um, I'm going to... If I've just got, I can't remember what time I started, but if I just give a few more minutes... Um, Actually, I need to take some advice from whoever my introducer was. Where, where was it? Oh, you're there. Yeah. Where, when would you like me to stop? Well, um, when would you naturally? You started about 10 to, so would you like so to stop? Was 10 to, is that 10 to? Okay, great, fantastic. Right, so that just gives me time to just do a couple of quick things. So I just want to talk about the word consensus, because you often hear, um, perhaps you hear, on the, on the media and so on, that there is a scientific consensus about uh, climate change. And people often misunderstand what that, consent, what that word consensus means. What is it scientists are agreed about? Because what they're not agreed about is a, is a specific uh, amount of global warming. Um, and a, a very common, so this is a graph, or a, a sort of distribution, if you like, which tries to estimate how much warming there will be, global temperature, if you double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So if you went from 285 to 560 parts per million, we're, we're sort of well on the way to 560, we're over 400, so by the end of the century we're probably up to 500 or more parts per million. So how, how, much, how much will the Earth warm to get back into some equilibrium with that doubled amount of carbon dioxide? And because of these uncertainties uh, that I talked about, particularly clouds, the answer is actually not a particular number, but a probability distribution. So along the x-axis, there's an amount of warming, 1 degree, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, 4 degrees, 5 degrees, 6 degrees, 7 degrees. Um, and a, and the, the sort of the vertical scale is a probability. 
So the most likely warming from the doubling of carbon dioxide, you probably can't read the number, is about two and a half degrees. But the really important, I think, point is that there's this tail. If you see, the distribution is, is, is not symmetric about the maximum. It's what's called skewed. And there's this tail out to four, five, six, even perhaps seven degrees, which can't be ruled out. That's where all these feedbacks line up in, in, a, in a bad way. Now, if we, I mean, the consensus is once you get past about two degrees, then you're in the, in the region where things really are dangerous. If you're talking about four, five, or six degrees, this is utterly catastrophic. This really is catastrophic climate change in every sense of the word. Sea level rise, storms, droughts, the ability of the human body to actually uh, lose heat become, I mean, places, most large parts of the world where that sort of warming, human beings literally cannot survive because they can't lose heat. But the point is that the consensus is not about a particular value. It's about that distribution. It's about the fact that there is a, we, can form, we, can, we can say quantitatively what we think the probability is that the warming will be, uh, you know, say, greater than 2 degrees or greater than 3 degrees or greater than 5 degrees or between 3 degrees and 4 degrees, whatever you want. There's a probability. That, that is that probability distribution that is the, that where there's this consensus. So you see the theme of my talk, whether it's weather forecasting or climate, is about thinking in terms of, of probability. Now, the point about saying this is that people who will claim... Now, it could be at one end. It could be a, you know, an environmentalist who say climate change will be catastrophic. There's no doubt about it. It will be catastrophic. If somebody says that, they're not being scientifically uh, uh, rigorous. They're not being credible. But similarly, somebody that says, I don't know, it's a hoax, or... Well, you know who says it's a hoax, but... <laughs> although, he, apparently, he doesn't say this anymore. But anyway, he used to. But, but more seriously, there's a, a group of, of people, Nigel Lawson, Matt Ridley, others, um, from the so-called Global Warming Policy Foundation, who say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, 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 I understand, you know, the greenhouse effect and all that stuff, but it's not, you know, in the big scheme of things, it's not a big deal. It's, it'll be, you know, Luke, the phrase, they'll say it's lukewarm. It's a lukewarm problem. So they're... They're banking for something on the far left-hand side of that uh, distribution. Well, again, that is just being inconsistent. It's not scientifically rigorous to say that. It's, it, I would, I'm just as critical of the, you know, it's going to be a catastrophe as it's going to be lukewarm. But the point is, um, whatever, if you say something specific, then you're wrong. That's not, at least that's inconsistent with our understanding. All right, so just in three minutes, because I've but I, I'm desperate to get this last point out. How do you actually make decisions under uncertainty? So I want to just um, think about, for, for a minute, um, uh, you are advisor to, to Fred, the ice cream seller. Um, and the amount of ice creams that he sells is proportional, well, it, it depends on the temperature of the next day. Now, he has to stock up. Uh, the day before with ice cream. So you have to advise, your, your job is to advise him on uh, what's, what, uh, how many ice creams to stock up. So there's, there's what an economist would call a utility curve. It tells you, uh, for a given temperature, this is the number of ice creams or the expected number of ice creams sold. So, for example, if it was 25 degrees, uh, it, you'd sell 70 ice creams. But notice how the shape, uh, it gets steeper on the, on the right-hand side. So... If it's, as it gets above 25 degrees, the number of ice creams really takes off in a big way. But as it gets less than 25 degrees, the number of ice creams is not quite so sensitive to temperature. Okay, so on a day, though this is now the forecast, and that blue line is, is a, you see, I'm trying to educate you about probabilities. It's a probability distribution, right? So it says that the most likely temperature forecast is 25 degrees, but it sort of could be a degree or so either side of that. Well, that's quite easy because um, you, can, you can estimate where the uncertainty is very small. It's pretty much the same as just reading off the value at the maximum probability, which is 25 degrees. So in that, that situation, you can sell, Fred, you're probably going to sell uh, 70, 70 ice creams. Um, but consider a situation where there is a lot more uncertainty so now we have a distribution. Again, the most likely temperature is 25 degrees, but it could be as much as, I don't know, 30 degrees or as less as 
20 degrees. So now what do you advise uh, Fred to do? Um, uh, he doesn't like, if you just can tell it's very uncertain, that's, you'll be fine. So you've got to do something a bit more positive than that. So if you're a statistician, you can actually calculate how many, given that distribution, how many ice creams you can expect to sell. But the important point about this is that because of the shape of that curve, the red curve, for every, temp for every degree to the right of 25 degrees, you're going to sell a lot more ice creams than the, the number fewer that you would sell if it was one degree cooler. So there's a kind of an asymmetry. That it, so the fact there's a chance of it reaching 30 degrees means there's a chance of a really phenomenally large um, number of ice creams sold. But on the other hand, if it's less than 25 degrees, that's not going to have such a radical impact on the number of ice creams sold. And in fact, what you can do is estimate the effective temperature. Given that uncertainty, you can say, actually, the amount of the expected number of ice cream sold is as if it was 28 degrees. So you can tell Fred, what you could tell Fred in that situation is, although you know the most likely temperature is 25 degrees, because of this big uncertainty, you can say, plan for it to be 28 degrees, and, uh, and that will give you 120 ice cream sold. So, that, so you can actually make a, a, a sort of rational uh, decision process under this situation of uncertainty. And when you have this sort of skewed dis nature where there's much more, the rate of increase is much larger when you get to the right of 25 degrees than 20 degrees, telling him that he will sell 70 ice creams, which is the most likely value, is actually not the right information to give him. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is that this translates directly into issues about climate change. Um, the most likely effect of a, a, a temperature rise to a doubling of carbon dioxide is about, as I say, about two and a half degrees. And based on econometric models, I've been working with uh, Chris Hope from Cambridge, uh, you can estimate global impact of global GDP is about $120 trillion, which is quite a lot. But it's much less than uh, the, the, taking the whole distribution into account. And again, the reason is that when you re reach four or five degrees, the impact of GDP is so much more uh, than going on to the colder side. There's a kind of an asymmetry. And those, those are the utility curves. It's a bit like the Fred's ice cream, but of, of global GDP uh, impact of temperature rise on global GDP as a function of temperature. And in fact, you can say, if you, I mean, what, you know, one, one way of saying this to a politician is to say what we should really see the effective, the effective temperature, what you should plan, even though the most likely is two and a half degrees, you should be planning as if it was almost four degrees because the impacts are so much larger uh, to the right of that curve. All right, so I'm done. Uh, why do we, so I rushed a little bit that last point, but I hope you just get. So why do why do weather forecasts go wrong? Well, the weather is chaotic, and sometimes, but certainly not always, sometimes can be very sensitive to small initial errors. So what can we do about it? Well, we've developed this idea of what's called ensemble prediction. We can do it because computers are, are big enough to allow us to run 50 forecasts every day, and so now we can be we we can know ahead of time when we can be confident about the future weather and when we can be cautious. And as I say, you hear that on the, on the BBC weather now, they say there's uncertainty. It's un there's uncertainty because the ensemble has got significant spread. Uh, does this all mean that reliable climate change predictions are impossible? No, uh, predictions are not chaotic like weather forecasts, but they are uncertain, and they're uncertain because of these feedbacks, particularly with clouds. Um, so the issue, the issue for people like you to, uh, to decide on is whether you, you think the risks of dangerous changes to climate are large enough to warrant mitigating action now. It's no different to deciding whether to park your Lamborghini under the oak tree or not. Uh, no, seriously, it's, it's absolutely no different. You, mitigating action means, you know, mitigating action means cutting our carbon emissions, and that comes with some economic costs. So the issue is, is it worth taking those economic costs now uh, if it will reduce the risks of dangerous climate change? Just as I can't tell you whether to park your Lamborghini under the car, under the oak tree, in a way I can't tell you either whether you should 
um, uh, whether, whether these risks are, are large enough or not. However, I would say this, that uncertainty should actually make us be more cautious about the future and not less so. And the reason for saying that is that tail, the fact that we cannot rule out this tail at uh, four, five, six degrees. And this is the tail where, you know, the Greenland ice sheet completely melts, completely disintegrates. It's where humans in large parts of the tropics physically cannot survive because the combination of temperature and humidity is too large. It's where storms just become unbelievably intense due to the extra water in the atmosphere. Um, so that is the risk of doing nothing. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it's, of course, the individual's decision about whether that risk is, is worth taking or not. So that's my talk. Thank you very much indeed.